Hello everyone, Sandra here with more Let's Make a Game Astro Collision. And there's not a whole lot to talk about in the editor today. Uh, I've added this structure for future purposes. And I have modified the world to be slightly less having skyscrapers in this area. Um, this is because most of my focus has been going on over here in the religion tab thingy. Um, so I've added some stuff here about basically I, I came to a point where I'm like, I need to work on some lore because I need to have some good solid lore. So to give a little bit of a, a background before I kind of delve into here, sort of my thought process going into this, a couple of things have been going on. I have been reading Lord of the Rings with my sister uh, for the first time uh, or my first time reading through Lord of the Rings and s being able to discuss some of what's going on in, in that with her, some of what Tolkien's doing with, uh, with his lore development, his, his world building in that. Um, thinking some about how Dark Souls does some of its world building, but also the the slow playthrough of prophecies, Guild Wars prophecies. There's a lot of stuff going on there with how they're telling their story, developing their lore and all that sort of stuff that I've been thinking about and uh, kind of mulling over, it, particularly in um, relation contrast, uh, basically kind of doing like a, a mental, like how are they doing it compared to how Tolkien did it and, and some of that stuff. And just thinking about all of those sorts of things. So that's been going on in my head, kind of in the background, thinking, okay, some of the Gilders One Prophecies lore feels kind of inconsistent in places, and like it's not entirely sure what's going on. And is this due to like an unreliable narrator? Or is it due to them kind of um there's a writing term called pantsing, which is sort of the idea of you're flying by the seat of your pants. It's kind of you're figuring it out as you go. And that's not necessarily like it, it's in contrast to plotting where you really plan stuff out in, in immaculate detail. And um, there's there's not necessarily one is better than the other. They're just different styles. But one of the things that can be a problem when you're pantsing it is um, if you don't really have time to do revisions and to try to make sure you shore stuff up. So I don't know where stuff is being... I'm, I'm trying to... Cameras doesn't go low enough. But anyway, I don't quite know spots where what they're doing with the lore development is stuff that just gets retconned later versus stuff where they're like being inconsistent. Like there's definitely inconsistencies. There's some areas where the people of Ascalon are referred to as Ascalons and there's other areas where they're referred to as Ascalonians. Ascalonians is the more common variety, but like there's an inconsistency there. Is that intentional? Is that unintentional? So there's a lot of these, these sorts of things going on where there's inconsistencies with the world building. Um, but then there's also stuff that I've seen where like quest saturation and how that affects things. And I'm definitely want to make want to make sure that there's enough stuff going on with characters that you're talking to. But anyway, I've I've come to realize that I really want to be building up my own understanding of what's going on internally. Because if you look at like Dark Souls, this is another area where I'm looking at a game where the lore of it. Uh, and and when I'm saying lore, I'm using it to differentiate between uh, what has happened, the story of the world versus the narrative, the story of the characters, um, the story that you're playing through in the game. So the lore of Lord of the Rings uh, is very important to it. Tolkien really cared about Middle-earth. He cared about building out the story. You'll get like your introduction to a place is like a page of exposition about the history of that place, for example. Um, and so you get that sort of thing. You also get a sense with Dark Souls that like there is somewhere an, an immaculately detailed lore document just describing all of the details of the stuff that happened, at least to a thorough enough degree that they can be consistent. When they ever they ran into a, I need to figure out what goes on here, they added an entry to it and everybody referenced it. And so it, it's a document that has to exist somewhere in From Software um so, somewhere they have this this document or or maybe it's whether or not they they still have it I don't know but somewhere they had this document that just immaculately lays out the detail of what happened but that we only get glimpses and peaks of it as players and, and my sister and I have talked about this some uh, you also see some of these uh sort of effects happen in uh, for example Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask or um Breath of the Wild where it's these hints of lore right uh the the way we kind of described it as we were talking about it was um, the frayed edge. So it's like you take a piece of paper and you like you tear it, right? And and you have this edge that is like frayed and inconsistent, and uh, it it looks like it's taken out of a larger hole, uh, a larger piece. Or you can have this with cloth as well, where the edges are frayed. 
it's this idea of like there's something more beyond there that this like connects to it harkens back to um but you don't quite get to see the see what that is. So there's something there, but you don't quite know what, but you get the sense of it, and it, it arouses your curiosity and your imagination and, and your excitement, and you want to know what's going on, what was here, what was going on, uh, what are the details of what's happened. So you see this in, in Dark Souls, for example. Um, you can go, like, what is that skull in Ash Lake? You know, that's a detail. You may or may not, think it's meaningful but when you start seeing these layers of this is meaningful and then this is meaningful and then this is meaningful combined with the combination of reliable narrators in the form of item descriptions and unreliable narrators in the form of npcs you kind of are building up this picture of okay what happened in this world how did it get to the state that it's in um and what is the story of the world you don't really care about the the narrative of dark souls of like what you the character are doing when you're playing that game and really get into uh, into what's going on, it's the the lore of the world. There are some narrative stuff that you care about, um, your Siegmeiers and so on and so forth. But for the most part, you're looking at what is the lore? What happened to this place? How did we get to this state? Um, what's truth? Uh, what What is the truth of the history of this place where it's being obscured by various individuals? You have The Legend of Artorias is a really good example. Um and so anyway, all of this sort of stuff is kind of things that I'm thinking about of like, okay, Tolkien has his way of building up the lore and, and the, the lore for Guild Wars Prophecies feels a little bit more, Slapdash isn't quite the right term nor thrown together, but it feels a little bit like areas feel deep and then other areas feel shallow and what are the things that kind of make that happen and um, how do I make sure I get the, a proper frayed edge feel? Um, and and how do I make sure that things are being done in a way that's consistent, that provides that that foundation of depth, that consistency of depth, somewhere to really, like, I feel like if I was able to push deeper on here, there would be something down there, not just, like, nothing, right? Um, how do I do that? Well, I need to know enough details myself of what went on in order to be able to do things consistently. So I'm beginning to build up that framework. I'm beginning to build up that foundation. So... That's uh, the, the preamble to what's going on in this document here. Uh, now, I worked on filling out this document a long time back in a sort of supplemental series where I was talking about religion in, in games and talking about some of the, the frustrations I have with how it's handled and, and stuff. And so I had sort of my ideas of like, what is the initial thing that's going on? Um, what is the, the, the situation? Uh from the very beginning, when the world was created, right? Starts with the world was created, the four races of humans, Felicor, Yadar, and Nerifa are created. They're in relationship with the creator. That is the extent of the religion um, at creation. Now, a lot of this initial stuff with this document was done specifically looking at sort of the religion angle, which is really important. Um, religion is like multifactorial. It goes into things like culture and, and other things as well. So to some extent it's religion, but it's also like the mythology of a place. What stories do they tell about themselves? Um, that sort of thing, uh, which may or may not have foundations in, in reality. But I'd gone through and I'd, I'd rigged up this document and figuring out, okay, what's going on with each place. And this was really useful, um, but it's fairly shallow. Uh, and we have some immediate stuff of what was going on with the various characters, like here, stuff about Sir Lionel and the Adventurer's Guild, um, and Sir Lionel's revered as a martyr, but his image has been distorted by his traitor friend, uh, and things like that. Who Lady Isabella was, she became the first queen, and the first dynasty came from her. Um, and uh, all of these sorts of details. These are things that I'm going to be working off of and making use of and, and whatnot as I develop things. But I realized I needed a much firmer foundation of what actually happened at the beginning. So this is where we get to the original eight progenitors, the first two humans, the, the male and the female, the, uh, the first two Felicor, the first two Yadar, and the first two Rifa. Who were they? What were they about? And the other thing that I realized I needed to address is technology. Because these people are being plopped down into a planet with no technology. So how does that develop? Uh, so I decided that hey, these guys have been uniquely blessed by the creator uh, with certain concepts, certain ideas, uh, certain intuition or instinct, perhaps, um, is the right way of framing it. So I was thinking about what would be really useful starting uh, intuition stuff. 
So that's where we kind of get into these guys. So the eight are created progenitors of the four species that, that uh, came to be known uh, were as teachers, right? They came to be known as teachers because they had this special instinct and they taught. Um, they're granted powerful intuition to a specific field, which they taught to others. So we have the humans. Uh, Farman, the father, agriculture was his thing. He understood how to cultivate plants. Um, Hitsuchikai is the mother, uh, and it had to do with stuff with taking care of animals, basically like livestock, that sort of thing. Um, I was just had some eggs for lunch, actually, and was thinking that a lore thing is like, there's a special way that you can distinguish uh, unfertilized eggs. Perhaps they have a, a certain sheen or luster about them, uh, maybe more of a pearlescent appearance as opposed to a dull matte appearance of a fertilized egg. Catch your attention. These are the ones that you can eat, and she'd pass on that detail. Uh, she would be aware of that and, and teach it. Uh, you have the fellow core. These guys are super big into learning. Uh, and the the male, Yes Griffinu, uh, figured out writing. He was the one to kind of invent writing. Uh, Lidrith, the mother, uh, understood magic, and she really began developing that. Then we have the Yadar Milamana, uh, created song. So these guys are um, Bonpoing and Hannah both come from them. Um, so so Bonpoing uh, from Divertier, actually Divertier is um, is the, the direct child, um, but Divertier uh, and uh, Ron Piety are are from them. So this guy uh, was all about song and music. Adami was all about soil and things like earthworks, identifying types of rocks, uh, that sort of thing. She's able to identify ores um, and kind of understand how to like locate stuff with the, with the earth. She probably worked a lot with Farman uh, as well as with Tommel. And that gets us to the Riffa with Tommel, who understood metallurgy, which might seem early, but remember we have magic. So I'll get to that. Uh, and then we have Triotep, which is the mother of pottery, uh, was the, the female here, and, and she was specialized in pottery, understanding how to work clay. Both of these have to do with the forge and the kiln and, and fire and using fire to adjust the world around you, which was something that I liked having them in common. So I figured this out, uh, and then I came down here and was like, Oh, yeah, there's this post astral collision thing of what happened, whatever. We'll get to it. Timeline events, not in any particular order. So this is stuff that needed to happen before the astral sundering. So the astral sundering is the event that preceded the astral collision. So the world was originally one, and then it was sundered into pieces. Um, if you actually look back inside the game engine to my introduction, and where did I stash this? Uh, way up here. My opening crawl says, The time has come for the resurrection of four of the prophets as ordained by the creator at the sundering of the world. That's a, a poignant opening line. And that opening line is dealing with the fact that the world was sundered into astral fragments. And so the, for the astral fragments have been reunited in a great collision. The shards of the world have been thrust together. And so the time has come for the immortal prophets to bring chaos to order, to mend the world, and to restore unto the people's knowledge of their creator. But which four prophets will be the ones to arise? So... I needed to figure out what things needed to happen before the world was broken up into pieces. What technology had people developed? What had happened? What had happened? Both to lead up to that event, why did it occur, but also like what things had been developed. So I was just like, here's a list of things I needed. I needed the development of farming, the development of livestock -ing, livestocking, um, and then proper quantity of families. What should this even look like? At least the 14 tribal leaders plus spouses. So we have the Riffa, we have Galden, and then Remora. Uh, these numbers, so it's like which one's male, which one's female, because again, they have to breed. Um, and then what order were they born? So of the Riffa, Galden was born first, Remora was born second. Keep in mind, we are dealing with first beings. There's going to be a lot of what would be termed incest in, in our modern idea, but this would have been a very di di uh, genetically diverse group, they would have been um, sort of the ur examples of their species. So as stuff develops, you begin to breed out specific traits. So just keep in mind that they're, from a genetic standpoint, it's a lot more stable. Uh, and it's just, it's necessary. You have two. You need to get more. They have children. Their children have literally nobody to have children with but each other. So it's just necessarily how it works. But as a society develops, that kind of spreads out. Um, the Felicor have Kaldisha and his Pacha. Now, it's important to keep in mind uh, that I've decided that there's a naming scheme with the Felicor. Males use this apostrophe and females do not. So, uh, and then Sindire and uh, Ilpania. 
And then Yadar has Ranpiety and Cordana, and Divertira and Mavan, uh, Mavania. Humans have Evanshire and Melissa. Uh, then there's Kendra and Onara. These two are born much later. We'll get into that. Sakratin and Elvira, Falsa and Justine, Kyushigai and Prim, uh, Primoko, uh, Elsana and Helson, Mavina and Gorn, Gornifond, uh, Yorgot Est and Sa- Saraha, uh, Tulador and Estroika. So these are the, the people that are like the progenitors. These are the tribes. So each one is like born to a certain group. So like Galden and Remora are the son and daughter of um, all the way back at the top. Um, all the way back at the top of uh, Itamal and Triotep, for example. So I also had some other things that needed to happen. I needed the development of writing system, uh, of the writing system and language, probably some old songs or poems to go with things. Yes, this is going to happen. Fire technology, notably pottery and metallurgy. What age did the start at? Copper, bronze, iron. I decided probably iron age made certain amount of sense, but I mean, it could vary. They can have stuff made of copper, of bronze, of iron. Basic, ma- basic magical theory. What does this mean? What could it be used for? Definitely for creating fire, maybe other things, possibly for writing somehow. Probably... Probably writing was done through magical means um, is, is kind of what I've settled on. So then I have the basic historical flow. What happened? So the creator forms the world, the cosmos, plants, uh, creatures, plants, and so forth, then makes the progenitors, the humans, the male farman and female Hitsujikai, the Yadar, the male Mulamane and female Adami, the Felicor, um, the male of which is Yisgrifenu, and the female is Ledrith, and the Rifa, the male Tomal, and the female Triotep. The creator then gifts these eight with special intuition and understanding, as well as with magic. Farman received a gift of agriculture. Like, this just goes through some of those details, right? We already talked about these. Um, Literate a gift for intuiting magic, Tamil for understanding mag- metallurgy, so on and so forth. When they had received life, these eight received this instruction from the creator. You are each of you different, gifted that you may aid each other. It is yours to rule this world and to guide it into its harmonious future. Go forth, multiply, learn from each other, and teach each other. And so they did this. Uh, they began by founding a village that uh, that they may learn from each other. They named this village Salem. Uh, though calling it a village would be would perhaps be an exaggeration. It'd be more accurate to call it a gathering place centered around a spring of clear of pure clear water. In those days, the world was pleasant and shelter was not needed. There, the Rifa built kilns to practice their metallurgy and pottery. Adami deposited collections of useful rocks and ores. Farman made his fields. Hitsujikai watched over livestock, collecting milk, eggs, and wool. Lidrith explored the workings of magic, and Yisgrifenu recorded her discoveries, uh, making a library that will be relevant later in the game. We'll talk about some of that in a moment. A bit, whatever it works out to be. And Melamane composed his songs and carved them into stones. And, of course, the pairs worked very hard on multiplying. Uh, in those days, there was little privacy and even less desire for it. They were naked and unashamed and enjoyed their spouses openly and with delight. In the course of time, the humans had a son and named him Promoko. Uh, he was the firstborn child of all the pairs, but only by the simple virtue of humans having a shorter gestation cycle than the other species do. Kaldisha and Divertir were born only a few months later, and Galden was born only a few months after that. At this point, Salem had a few specific amenities. It had a farm with both fields and animals, a library with knowledge of magic, and the world, and many other pieces of knowledge, as well as wisdom from the creator and many songs, various simple musical instruments, farming implements, quite a few different pieces of pottery, a granary, a lavatory, some simple furniture, and some art, primarily clay and metal sculptures. In the course of time, more children were born uh, to the progenitors, who over time came to be known as the teachers, for they taught many things, aside from the gifts given to them by the creator from which to teach they had a great deal of accumulated knowledge and wisdom to share. Again, they became, a, they were entered in the world as adults, uh, and they began learning about the world, and so they taught their children, and so on and so forth. So they are seen in the eyes of their children as teachers, as people with lots of knowledge. Now, and in time, Kendra and his younger sister, Onara, were born, grew up, and wed. Uh, this probably should be rewritten to twin, because I've made them twins. Um, for time, all was well. Salem flourished and grew. Yorgat Est and Saraha, those adventurous and curious souls were the first to set off to explore the world. Every so often, they and their increasingly large family returned home to tell of all they had seen. Kyushigai began composing tales, imaginings of beings upon the moons. Uh, Primoko, her beloved husband, loved to listen to her tales. He was the first to begin painting and loved to make drawings inspired by her. So this is important. Kyushigai is the leader 
of the of um her shard uh or like it's named after her because promoko who is the elder uh took more of a um a lower position than her she is more of the leader and he was more the follower uh even though he was born first so Evanshar, Melissa, Ron Pidey, and Cordona all loved to study the wisdom of the creator and were prolific writers on the subject, as uh, was Ron Pidey and Cordona's daughter, Hannah. So Hannah, one of the playable characters, is born during this time. Um, Divertier and Myvania made spectacular dances from their father Melamane's songs. Tulador built the first boat, and she and Estroika began to explore the large lake that Salem bordered. There they found islands with new things and delicious fruits, and they became expert swimmers, and so on. Families grew, and in a few generations, Solemn was bustling and quite spread about. Three generations have been born at this point, the teachers, their immediate children, and their children's children. And then came Kendra and Onara. Onara was devoted to her brother, who was a shepherd. However, it was he who first had darkness enter his heart, for he envied the fame and recognition of his older siblings. It was at this point that Hannah became the first prophetess among them all, for she began to receive terrifying dreams. Not long afterwards, disaster struck when Kendra took a farming scythe and butchered one of the sheep over which he had watch. With that, harmony was shattered. Kendra wanted renown, and he got it. Evanshire and his followers condemned the act, and anyone else who had failed to follow, follow suit. Sindara was fascinated by the sheep's interior and wanted to study the insides of more creatures. Kaldisha wanted to know what happened to the sheep's life and debated this topic endlessly with his kin. Falsaw and his followers demanded justice be enacted, though they could not agree on what justice was. Yorgot S. led her family away from there, wishing to flee the horror of it all, promising to never return. Elsana and her kin blamed the sheep for failing to prevent its own destruction. Sacriton feared what he saw in Kendra. Hushigai and her kin wanted to ignore the horror of it and pretend it had never happened. Divertier resented the attention shifting away from his performances to this event. Mavina tried to use magic to resurrect the sheep and failed to her own deep frustration. Tulador had been away at the time, and when she heard the chaos, turned and returned to her boats, not daring to discover what had been done. Ron Piety mourned and wrote the first lament, and Galdon attempted to bring this chaos and discord to order, but when he failed, he vowed to have nothing to do with the rest of and left with his people. So this is the immediate fallout of this event. It doesn't seem significant to us, but keep in mind, this is a time when there is no death, uh, aside from, like, some stuff with plant life. Um, this is a time when, like, things are at peace. This is being inspired by Eden, right, uh, in, in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. It's that sort of mindset of this is an innocent place, and then this event happens, it is seen as horrific, and, and so there's a bunch of different responses. So these responses are really important. It's why everything gets fractured. It breaks the harmony. So for their part, the teachers at first worked with Galden to try to, to try and bring harmony. Galden left against the wishes of his parents, and at that time, they cried out to the creator. That night, every single person shared a common dream, a vision in which the creator spoke. So this is kind of the like actual prophetic words here that then get referenced at the start. Uh, so, since you have chosen division instead of harmony, sundered will be the world because of you. You will cover yourselves with shame, strife will haunt your steps, and death will swallow you up. Those formed by my hands I shall take to be with me, and I shall ease their pain and heal their hearts. As for the rest of you, in time, I shall send unto those... Um, I shall send... Uh, this is why... I, I knew I needed to like proofread this and stuff, but... I shall send unto you those who shall remind you of what was and warn you of what will come. For the world will not stay sundered, but when its sundering ceases, great strife, pain, and destruction shall come forth as a day of judgment falls upon the land. Yet I shall send four of those who spoke to you, and they shall bring healing to the land and cleanse it of the great torments. And once their task is complete, the value of harmony shall be impressed upon all, and a new peace will be forged. So this is what you're doing in the game. This, this right here is is the game uh and when they awoke the world was changed they were cut off the world had indeed been sundered so this this leads me up to things we'll get into the nature of magic in a moment uh but it also brings me to this right here which is um my timeline tool i should move this over a little bit so you can see it more clearly i made this uh actually on this channel you can see videos of me working on this uh, i will leave a link to the playlist in the description below if you are curious in seeing that process, but I'm using this to sort of record these events in a way that I can keep track of them temporally. So, um, actually, if I go here and display, uh, sure, all. This gets really 
bunched up when I do this because stuff is kind of on top of each other. But if I spread it out a little bit, you can see we have the creation, the founding of Salem. I didn't put in all of the births because it was getting tedious, but th we have the birth of Promoko, then Kaldisha, Divertir, and Galdan, the birth of Evanshire, so on. The birth of Estroika is kind of the last one before the birth of Kendra and Onara uh, in 42. And then in 66, Slaughter of the Sheep. Then this is where that was like late in that year. And again, I have more details down here. Uh, the twins faded to each other. Uh, they thought uh, the two were devoted to one another. This is late in the year, and then relatively early in the next year, the astral sundering occurs, uh, which is the astral sundering. And then I have a separate timeline for Kendra. Um, so right here we have uh, that the astral sundering occurred r relatively early in this year. So there's a little bit of time. The idea here is that there was some time where there's debate and like stuff happening and people getting further and further apart and Galden was not able to rally things around and, and the teachers were not able to rally things around. I don't know exactly how long it was, but I have a little bit of wiggle room of saying, you know, it was late this year and very early this year. It could have been weeks, could have been months, but the basic idea is that this there's a bit of period of time in between, right? Um, Salem, I'm going to be retconning. The Salem was not lost. Um, uh, but the spring was. Okay, uh, good old save. Um, and then we have the events in Kendra. They woke up, state of the world. Uh, Onara and Kendra died in this year. Onara perished first, Kendra soon after. Their son, Bohemius, succeeded Kendra as king. Morning was great. And then the astral collision uh, and some of the stuff there. So you can see, like, that occurs, and we come down a ways. And actually, if I pull this back out, you can kind of see, like, oh, here's how things kind of line up. This main timeline doesn't really rejoin until... I decided it about 3,000 years was a good period of time. So the astral collision occurs after 3,124 years. Um... The fact that this is one, two, three, four was not intentional. I just wanted some number there. And I'm going to leave it that way. If people want to read into that, they can. So the astral collision is 3,191 years after the creation of the world. Um, as it were. So this this timeline is something that I am started working on and will be adding more details to as I go on just to kind of flesh stuff out. And I'll be doing one of these for each of them. I'm probably going to go through the histories of the places when I work on them. So right now in the game... I am working on Kendra. I'm really trying to get Kendra fleshed out. Fill in the details, fill in the world, fill in stuff. So that's actually what, uh, if we go back, not there, uh, here. This is going to be the cat, the royal catacombs. And Kendra and Onara will have a tomb in here. Uh, as well as, you know, other royals. Like, it's been a long line. Um, the royals have lost a lot of power since the initial day. So I also have figured out the poem for this the tomb of kendra and onara his bride who were doomed to death by his foolish pride and the land of kendra where monsters roam and heroes serve those who fear to leave home so that that is uh a thing there um so this is very much so in progress uh i'm plan like i said i'm planning on adding each one of these like astral shards because there's going to be you know 14 of these I'm going to be adding each of them as I go. Um, and so I will work on figuring out what happened in Kendra's past and then flesh Kendra out and then do that for Evanshire and um, eventually Sindire and so on and so forth. So this is what's going on with this. Um, this is proving to be longer than I thought it might be. That's whatever it is. Uh, okay, so a couple of other random things um i've decided that these monuments appear at when at the birth of the prophet so this was not here originally uh, and it appeared later also the spring that i mentioned uh so if i go back over here um this spring in uh, in salem which means peace in arabic i think that's the idea is that it's peace. Um, but I didn't want to use the more obvious, like, Hebrew-derived Salem. Um, as in, like, Jerusalem, right? It's peace in there. Uh, anyway, so the name of the village, Salem. Uh, a spring of pure, clear water. This 
is in the game. Uh, if I scroll the right way to find it. This Forgotten Temple is going to be the, the spring, that spring. So um, it's contained in here. And I'm going to be changing the stuff on this and this placard because the meta tutorial is no longer a character and so on and so forth. And like everything has changed at the beginning. So I'm, I'm going to be updating that text now that I know what's going on with that. Um, Salem, the rest of it ended up in Ron Piety for whatever that's worth. Um, I figured out that much. Okay. So the other thing that I realized I needed to do is I needed to figure out what the nature of magic was. Oh yeah. Here's my note on monuments. Monuments arose in each region at the birth of the prophet for that region. The exception is Ron Piety. Those monuments were established from the beginning since Hannah was born before the astral sundering. Uh, so the nature of magic. Hey, I have magic in my game. What a shock. This needs to work a certain way, and I need to understand how it's actually working in a sort of metaphysical sense. Like, what is the underlying principles behind how magic works? So, let's dig into that. Uh, so, magic comes in two varieties, largely speaking. The first is kinetic magic, which augments actions, such as attacks, shouts, farming motions, etc. It is fueled by energy built up by activity and movement, which gets called tensia. TP. Tensia. Um, I needed to figure out some word. This is the word I decided to go with. I don't know if it actually means something because it's not being underlined. But here we are. Uh, if it does mean something rude, let me know. The second type of magic is mental magic because I couldn't resist calling it that and because it made sense. F Hands of Magic the Gathering will will know. Potentially have heard of mental magic. but Anyway, mental magic, which draws off of mana. Mana itself is stored within the body of all living, uh, within the body of all living things, though it will slowly seep out of an individual i.e. there's a cap. On the other hand, it can also be drawn in. It is produced uh, so you can like store reserves of it in something and draw from that is the idea here. It is produced as a byproduct of uh, metabolization. So as your body metabolizes things, mana gets produced as a byproduct. Uh, mental magic functions by manipulating basic elements of nature. These elements can then be combined to create more complex forms of magic. For example, fire and earth magic can be combined to manipulate metals. This was very important for metallurgy, as I say here. And indeed, this type of complex magic is the first discovered and refined for the purposes of metallurgy and craft as established by Tommel. Gaining skill at using magic requires extensive study and talent. Not everyone is talented in all types of magic, so while they may be able to use it with enough study, it will be hard to build actual proficiency without some gifting. It should also be noted that basic magic can be used by anyone, though this magic typically has, minimally, uh, has minimal combat applications. The most commonly used basic magic is that of producing a small flame. Why you can actually have it not be completely dark in the caves is my explanation. Uh, so for those who may remember um, from last week, I think it was, um, in the mine, we had the old mine area here where it was like pitch black when you walked in. The fact that it's not, like, completely dark is because of the ability to, like, generate a candle-like flame. Um, like, you, you don't get much light off of it, but you get some. Um, yes. This can be used to light space, provide a minimal amount of heat, or start a fire, which is the most common purpose. Uh, it is possible to just produce a light with basic light magic, i.e. not a flame, but just a glow. But given that light magic is a complex type of magic, it's combined of fire and water, it is slightly more technically complex than producing a candle-like flame. Various items can also interact with magic. For example, objects taken from once living things, such as wood, teeth, feathers, or bones, to name a few examples, can often be treated to be reservoirs for mana. Further, spellcraft itself involves a sort of shaping and forming. It is possible to create structures that do this automatically, as long as mana or tensia is provided, depending upon the spell's needs. So this is the idea of why equipment has skills attached to it. Like, skills are often a combination, are either used like tensia or mana, and can fall into this kinetic or mental. Uh, spell sword is an intramural, I don't know, it's, it's a combined discipline that uses some amount of uh, kinetic magic and some amount of mental magic to combine into, like, a more powerful swing with your sword on fire, for example. Um, and that's a, a combination of tensia and, um, and mana that are used because it combines the arts. Hi, I have 
retroactively explained why my skills work the way they do. Uh, various crystals and certain metals have been found to be particularly good conductors and shapers of magical energy. On the other hand, it is possible to create them out of other substances, specifically the ability to create scrolls out of previously living materials, such as paper made from wood, leather, plant fibers, or furs. Like, uh, this would be taking, like, fur and, like, making a, um, a piece of cloth from it, uh, for example, uh, like wool. Um, or you can make cloth out of, like, flax to make linen. Um, so things like that is, is what's being talked about here. Um, and, uh, so these can hold a small charge of mana to function while they don't require any mana to use because they're holding a store of mana. They do tend to burn themselves out in a single use. So this is uh, kind of an explanation for the, uh, scroll items I have down here. Like the scroll of lightning reflexes provides your party with the lightning reflexes buff. These scrolls are made using this technique. Uh, they, the process of casting the spell literally burns the scroll up. Uh, it consumes it in that way. But this is a way that you can kind of store magic if you know the craft and can set up the, uh, the proper way of having the shaping of the mana uh, done through an external means. Again, like you can shape it through your own will. You use your will to shape magic, or you can use an external apparatus. Um, Skill sets represent shaping by will, things like this weapon having this weapon having grape smash is because the shaping is built into the the weapon. And so all you do is you channel the tensia points, the TP, into the the club and it enables the skill to come forth. So that's kind of the idea. I have uh therefore explained how my magic works. Um Yes, I think that kind of covers a lot of these details. Um, I'm just going to add a line here, which is usually done with the will. So this this whole thing is, is what I've been working on uh, this week, for the most part, with uh, some of those additional little things I pointed out in the... Uh, in the editor, but most of most of my focus has been on this stuff. It turns out to be there's also another note that I made down here, which is that Evan Chire is going to need some religious stuff um, that like people do. Um, but that's that's for future thinking. Um, I've also decided that uh, anybody who was early, so like let's see early early, that's within the first thousand years, the second thousand years is middle, and the last thousand years is late. Um, so, yeah. This sort of stuff is a lot of concentrated creativity to, to do, and is definitely quite mentally exhausting to kind of work some of this stuff out, but I'm hoping that with uh, with some practice it will, will get a little bit easier, but that's what's gone on this week, and um I think that covers all of them details. Again, if you want to see the process of me making this tool, uh, I will include a link to that playlist in the description. But for now, I think that kind of covers things. Um, I will be continuing to add stuff here, continuing to flesh out the lore, and uh, using that to kind of build things up. Something else that I need to make that I should make note of, and we'll actually just go down here. Um, Whoops, Idioms does not have an N in it. I also need to come up with a with some stock idioms, some stock phrases. People have different things that they say in in their language, different reactionary phrases. Um, and you'll you'll see this thing happen. Like uh, I think in Harry Potter they use like by Merlin's beard as an example of the sort of thing that I'm talking about. So I just need to to have some stuff like that. Um, that I've provided as um, kind of a linguistic foundation for things. A lot of this is going to be drawn from the teachers, I've, I've decided, just to keep things consistent across places, although they will probably develop some of their own uh, within the places as well. So uh, I will, I'll have to figure some of that stuff out as well. Uh, and there's some other conventions and stuff that I've been thinking about, like some places will eat meat and other places will not uh, eat meat and stuff like that just natively so for example ron piety probably doesn't eat meat whereas kendra certainly does and like no particular moral call on that it's just like 
the traditions of the place because of of um how things happen with the uh the astral sundering and all of that sort of stuff so it's just like what is the historical basis for this place uh in the context of the lore that i'm creating for the world so anyway that's gonna go ahead and wrap this up for me i think uh as i i think i have covered all of the different details of the things that i talked about and uh yeah i'll be continuing to flush out this stuff and hopefully get to a point where i feel confident enough to return to further map development type things but until then everyone uh, until next time thank you for watching take care and goodbye <laughs>